Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 301. That's 301. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Pretty good. Pretty good, all things considered. Today is, uh, should we date this and say it's Bank Holiday Monday? Well, it's too late now, I've already said it. Today is Bank Holiday Monday, sometime in the evening. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing fine. Hope you're not, um, what do you call it, comatose or have any kind of overdose on chocolate goodness, which I've had in the last couple of days, actually. I did quite a good job in terms of keeping my hands off any kind of additional chocolate treats, especially this morning. Most of the stuff that was on sale yesterday or the day before that was, you know, hiked up to its maximum price. And then because Easter's now passed, it's all got slashed. They're all like a quid for massive Easter eggs with little treats on the side. But I did well. I kept my hands off of it got my avocados and ran out of that place but yeah um you're probably likely to go and see, i wonder what they do with all them anyway what if when they can't sell them i'm sure they just probably pass them off to Poundland and all those kind of places right because you know by month or by tuesday basically wednesday thursday it's basically become null and void unless you're a psycho that likes to buy easter eggs for your lunch i don't know but for the most part they're not very much they're not um they're quite time sensitive, aren't they? Those kind of traits. But I wonder what they do with them. Do they? Give, I'm sure it's a Poundland thing. It's probably not. You're not going to probably give this away to a homeless shelter, are you? I'm not sure somebody without a roof, right, or without kind of dry clothes is going to be that enamored with give, being given a Cadbury egg for to eat in it. That's not really what they're looking for, really. And you can't necessarily exchange that for any kind of class A substances either. I'd imagine. You know, not to say they take them, but you know, I'm not sure you can do that. But anyway, that that aside. Feeling good, feeling great. Um, start of the week has begun a bit slow, as it usually does on bank holiday weekends. Um, usually these kind of days are when you're spent most of your morning or afternoon recovering from some sort of hangover due to the past weekend activities. But because we're on lockdown, because we're all being told to stay indoors, because we have been banned from congregating in large groups, essentially people shouldn't be hungover really, unless you had little private uh indoors in residence little bank holiday weekend a gathering then probably you should be in a better state than you might have been last year which is might be a good thing and you might be looking at yourself thinking you know what i might need these incremental bursts of time where i'm just stuck indoors having nothing to do because you yeah don't get me wrong you can get tipsy you can get wrecked at home if you want to but that has its limit too right part of the reason why you people like pre-drinking at home is because it's a pre-drink before you go out to do something else right it's not necessarily the pinnacle of your evening again unless you're a psycho who puts on their own raves in your own house which i don't know if people do that maybe they do with boiler room and all that stuff you can probably get away with having all your bluetooth con- speakers connected to a system get the person that's playing live online to stream via your whatever you know maybe you'd put your phone on ig live in the corner of the room scan can have a bit of fun you could do that if you wanted to but you know it's a bit weird most people would just probably get a couple of tinnies rack up a few lines hang out at home a bit and then venture out to go see some strangers or to go see some guy or girl play behind a decks in a really dimly lit room with speakers blaring into your ears um, but we can't do that at the moment so we have to do what we have to do um, so what have I done this week to change things up I've kind of enacted a bit of a schedule I've got a routine I've got a daily ritual as you might have seen from this book I mentioned last week by Mason Curry this is one of the first books that was featured in Tim Ferriss's uh, book club that he ran for a short period of time I think it might have been a year or so then he kind of put it on ice but essentially he was recommended a few books for us to read if you're part of the book club you kind of email I think he'd send him out an email and it was also part of his blog where he basically took a book where he he thought a book that would would be of value to people whether it's you know self-improvement whether it's just some fiction whatever it may be you took the book you devoured it and then there was a time to obviously you know get involved in the community reply in the comments and share your thoughts I picked up this daily rituals, which was probably, I think, the first one I'm going to say in the routine. I'm not sure if it was the first, but it's probably around the first ones. And it was really eye-opening. Essentially, each page or each you know few pages on the book highlights one influential thinker, great mind, and kind of breaks down their daily rituals and routines. Some people on here, the funny thing about some of the people featured is that a lot of them are quite adamant they don't have a ritual or routine they're like no i'm just a free spirit i do whatever but then once they grill a bit deeper whether it's via whether it's just them you know talking to themselves and kind of figuring out what they do you you can kind of patch together a bit of a framework as to what gets done at what time and you know 
what what's that saying they say um what can't get what, what was it what can't get measured can't get improved or whatever there's some term people use right but the idea of like flying by a seat of the pants at that kind of level especially if you're talking about i don't know let's pick someone randomly who did to list someone role known that we all know here if you're talking about igor Strav- stravinsky samuel beckett uh Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce, all these people, it's unlikely they're going to be at that level, prolific as they are as writers, intellectuals, whatever it may be, without some kind of um, routine or rituals that they do in order to kind of get the best out of whatever field of study they are into. So obviously, work aside, people's schedules are a bit up in the air at the moment. Everyone's sort of doing whatever, right? They're just trying to make sure each day feels like a different day because at the moment it feels a bit like Groundhog Day. So in order to kind of help I've decided to do a ritual which includes I've got it here on my list actually of stuff that I've got to tick off but I've downloaded this app called coach.me I'm not sure if anyone's used it but it's really handy as well I think it's another one that Tim Ferriss might be involved into um, it's this app here coach.me as you can probably see on the screen can you see that there da, da, da. nope it's not loading up there can you see that nope it's not picking up is it anyway it doesn't matter so essentially it's a to-do list that you basically add different tasks and things that you want to do during the day and then each task you can also specify how many days in the week they're going to get done so if you if if it's like you know running for instance i might want to do that five times in a week Monday to friday so you just put five little dots down and then you can kind of tick them off as you go along and the best part about it i think is each topic each was thing that you put down especially for something that a lot of people are doing whether it's sit-ups or whatever maybe or journaling there'll be a little subgroup a little community that you can basically comment with and ask questions and reply i think as you can can you see that a little bit there probably not basically i would describe the screen but the screen is sort of like it's got like a massive button there you can press to say you've done it and then you can answer some questions down below see so you also doing it in the day it's really handy sort of thing to you so i've got here each day i'm going to do 100 push-ups sit-ups um, journaling in the morning which includes just writing down my morning thoughts things i've kind of thought about during the day just to kind of get rid of that brain fog uh listen to an audiobook for an hour read for an hour and run and then write a blog post of course i'm doing that at the moment on my website called uh, defaultgoon.com check that out if you're not already but that's the kind of routine and ritual that i've kind of uh laid out for myself over the last over the next few weeks I think in the UK we have a review as to what's going to happen with the lockdown, whether or not they're going to extend it, they're going to shorten it, or they're probably going to extend it. It's unlikely they're going to shorten it. People have been acting a fool lately, but there's a there's a review happening. So there's some time to kind of analyze as to uh, what goes on next. But I'm assuming my assumption will be that we'll be in this condition probably until the end of June. I'm going to say, judging by what's happening. And then I guess from July, they'll start relaxing it a little bit more, maybe enacting the same change they did in Spain and maybe allowing people from the manufacturing industry to go back to work or other essential workers. Um, and then little by little, I think companies will have to make a decision as to what they do. Will they Do they allow uh, most of their workforce to come back to the office? Do they still have an office? Those are things that are still going to be up in the air. But I think... I definitely do encourage um definitely number one picking up this book daily rituals especially if you're stuck in the mire and you don't know what to do and you're trying to figure out how to plan out your days definitely recommend you check this out and then secondly just get a to-do list get some kind of a daily habit tracking app that you can use and spec out a few things i, I try and be as specific as i can like i've got write a blog post right for each day it doesn't have it, i don't specify what topic it can be yet just write one so that's a win for me um, but you have to be super specific like so you know whether it's like write 500 words about a certain subject put that down so that there's, so that there's an intention and action behind that can follow it as opposed to just like some flowery you know um, general sort of goal thing that usually sort of works for me and again try and keep them as small as possible you know start with one or two and then try and build them up as you go as you proceed um, you, what you want to aim for is consistency not just volume you don't want to just have loads of things on there so you can feel good about yourself and then you know in a couple of days once the motivation is gone it all comes crashing down that's not the way to do it but yeah that's what i'm doing for now going forward um but yeah what else has been happening oh actually in terms of uh <clears throat> interesting lockdown news i just saw actually that supposedly uh monzo bank have kind of let go a few people and uh due to the whole lockdown because I've, I've not seen that much news again maybe i've not been paying attention 
because the tech startup world in London seems to move as quickly as it does in any other place, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, so things are always changing. But I, I always have the impression that a lot of the startups or founders or whatever they may be in London are quite close. You know, they're quite close lipped about what actually goes on. The journalists probably aren't as investigatory whatever that term is as it may be in the states so some of the things that happen sometimes sit through the cracks right people can sometimes get away with murder in london more so than they may be able to do in the us but news has kind of come out this has been featured by uh TechCrunch, that monzo's uh ceo and founder has decided to not take salary for the next 12 months in order to help the staff uh you know help to keep I guess the majority of the staff on board and obviously he's decided to enter a few of them into the voluntary furlough plan. So this is an article here from TechCrunch that sort of details it. It says Monzo CEO wants excited for 12 months after a limited number of staff offered a uh, furlough. So I'm assuming, so let's read this because a furlough usually should be applied to everyone, right? But let's see what's happening here. It says, uh, it says Monza, the UK challenger bank with over 400 million subscriber account holders, sorry, is taking a number of precautionary steps to help see it through the current coronavirus downturn, including voluntary furloughs and a CEO foregoing a salary tech crunch understands. In an internal company wide member issued by the co founder and CEO, Tom Bloomfield, he tells the bank's over 1,500 staff that he won't be taking a salary for the next 12 months. Jesus, that's a nice, that's a um, very honorable thing for him to do. And at the senior manager, team and the board have volunteered to take a 25% pay cut as salary as have other Monzo notes within a company. In addition, a number of Monzo's UK employees are being offered voluntary furloughing for two months as part of the scheme rolled out by the UK government to protect jobs during the coronavirus lockdown, which is already impacting many companies, not just Monzo, including several other fintechs I know. Furlough ensures that employees still get paid even when work was decreased and that when things have happily returned to normal, there's a job to come back to. Although well capitalized like other banks and fintechs, Monzo has seen customers' card spend reduced at home and of course abroad, meaning it has less seen less revenue from intercharge intercharge fees, sorry. So their model is entirely um, resting on the fact that they have a big user base and people are spending money, basically, which is interesting, isn't it? Because it's a challenger bank, but it still works the same way. Banks, I guess, your standard bank, what makes money on loans and credit and overdraft fees and all that sort of shit. So they work the same way, which is a bit of a frightening situation. It means that essentially they're going to need to compete with Lloyd's, with Barclays, with NatWest, with Nationwide on the same level in order to kind of see any real returns really, you know, that's what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to somehow get the lion's share of customers to jump on their platform, which is difficult because, you know, those banks are, because I'm not sure how confident people will be, you know, regular folk will be about, you know, dealing entirely with their banking via their smartphone not having any place to kind of walk into because i know that's why you know my mom will probably wouldn't mind switching to follow not follow sorry switching to monzo but it's the idea that she couldn't necessarily go and talk to somebody in the physical location and have a meeting about something on an isa or a loan or an overdraft would probably put a lot of people off i'm assuming it's definitely a millennial product which probably which probably makes leads me to believe that they're probably banking on the fact that a lot of the older clients that are you know still uh who still believe in the conventional banks are sort of going to phase out or you know die out for lack of a better term and once a new generation pick up steam who are you know essentially you know they are smartphone native you know you give a two-year-old an ipad these days and they know what to do with it more than you do so it probably makes sense that they're probably banking all their you know all their hopes on the next generation coming up and wanting to do all their banking online or via their smartphone but yeah interesting that um and it continues here so therefore it makes sense to utilize the furlough scheme to help protect jobs in the future when the demand picks up again this article looks like it's written by somebody that's very much uh, a big fan of monzo <laughs> by making it voluntary it also means that staff with kids uh to homeschool or loved ones to take care of can use the option to hopefully make their lives easier to, to, for the time being so which is good in it because i guess following obviously for the companies is a bit of a sting because i'm assuming they're gonna have to front the cash before the cash comes in from the government because from what i understand the government cash for furloughing is only going to get credits in the company's account in june so they're gonna have to cover the wages for the next couple of months which probably makes sense because everyone will do that right that's probably your quote-unquote severance package you'd get especially after you've passed your probation and you've had a year i think every year after or every two 
after two years of employment, I think it's a month or something. So you, you know, that covers them for that much. Uh, but I guess the the main benefit of the furlough is the fact that your job will still be open. It'll be s- similar to like you know going on a sabbatical, right? But your job is still there for you once you come back, which is great to see. Um, so specifically, I understand Monzo is accepting up to one hundred and seventy five furlough applications with customer support, and up to what two hundred and twenty applications from. So not everybody's going to get it. I'm assuming there's only a certain amount because I'm sure they have more customer support agents than that. He says, meanwhile, at least one other UK challenger bank is using the government's furlough scheme. Star- Starling has confirmed that it has put up to 41 people on furlough. In contrast, Revolut has touched conscious. No, it has no current plans to do so. As already mentioned, the scheme is available to UK companies right across the board and several startups, including fintechs, have already applied for furloughing as a precautionary measure. Lastly, it should be stressed that none of the above should impact customers at Monzo, which is a digital bank is pretty well positioned to operate during lockdown. Is this written by Monzo or is this written by TechCrunch? This is a bit bloody hell. It also has a fully licensed bank with customers' deposits up to £85,000 predicted as the UK government's dep- Deposits protection scheme. The comment by Ain Bowden, founder of Sterling Bank, is below. But yeah, so yeah, um, Sterling Bank did a U-turn as well on that. But that's interesting to see. In it. one of the bigger, more uh, I'd say well admired startups. I think if you talk to anyone that's worked in startups in London, the one place they all kind of dream to go, or they have a lot of great things to say, is Monzo. Right? Um, there's a lot of um, goodwill out there for them as a company so for them to go through what they're going through is difficult i'm assuming for us as customers of monzo it's also difficult to know that you know all this disruptions had been in the background but you're hoping you're hoping because you'd imagine the banking sector will be able to survive somewhat there could be robust because people are still going to need to move their money around regardless of what's happening um in the world right now and maybe once everything gets back to normal they'll be the first to get back on their feet but yeah um thoughts and feelings go out to everybody at Monzo is affected by it hopefully those guys are protected and the furlough application goes through as may be and you know they're able to come come back into their roles once they've all the dust settles and all that stuff but again it's a great um touch from the ceo and founder you don't get a lot of these stories usually from startups usually the founders are proper wankers so for someone like him to decide to forgo a year's worth of pay right you know he might have money anyway but still it's his you know he's more than entitled to get a salary and if he's you know deciding to uh put it to one side for a year which then allows the senior members of staff only to take a 25 percent cut which is awesome too right they're only taking 25 percent hit on it as well they're not having to do as drackers measures him which is great to see he's um definitely as describing by the idea of like great eat um great eat leaders eat last right he's not doing the kind of the thing that um what's his face the guy people that i owe did to us and we whilst we were there where he kind of essentially scammed us all out of our money and ran off into the sunset um, but yeah, well done to him. Du, 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 du. Let's move on here. What else we got to talk about? So, quickly jump in some topics. Got loads of stuff to get on with. Um, why not? Let's not. Why not we touch on this one? Actually, I thought this was pretty cool. So, these leaked. I think the other day, or just well, not leaked. I'm not sure. Is it a leak with that you got four images high res, potentially? But let's see. So this is a, an image from High Snobiety of these new rubberized off-white dunks, which I'm assuming is an extension of the, you know, the artificial resurgence of dunks back in the street or sneaker market at the moment. It seems like, you know, every other week there's new dunk popping out of the woodwork. Nike are doing their very best to make this a thing. I'm not necessarily sure it is. Um, for what I've seen so far, judging by the fits online, kids are still wearing, you know, really chunky trainers or Jordan 1s or uh, designer shoes for the most part, or whatever, or whatever, yeah? But I don't really see the dunk being a thing. I, I've even seen a little bit more of a resurgence in the Air Force 1, especially off the back of the Supreme one. So this is a bit of an odd one that they're really pouring a lot of money and resources into making this a thing. But, you know, Nike have more money than god and able to just you know do these um self what do you call it these sort of uh exercises that only benefit themselves really don't really benefit the customer in any way shape or form it's just like an exercise in branding for the sake of it but as a model i think they're pretty interesting so it's a headline from high snobai he says here's our first look at your white and nike rubberized dunk so essentially you got a dunk model i think silhouette that's been made to look like your retro DCES sort of chunky skate shoe from the 90s era. 
Um, the interesting part of it is that it's a Nike SB, so I'm assuming it's a newer model that maybe Virgil was asked to work on and contribute some ideas to, or maybe it was a model that was already in line to kind of come out, a new model they had already in the stash, and what they usually do when collaborations, so I'm sure most of you know this, but what they usually do when they're doing collabs is that they'll usually hit up somebody who they think aligns well with the brand or with the model they're trying to bring out so they can introduce it to the market with a brand co-sponsor or co-sign and then once it drops with the brand co-sign they're able then to kind of you know um roll out some grs or some tier zero kind of colorways maybe with some retailers maybe with some other lower tier brands and then from there if it's a success it gets uh, filtrated into the general market if it's a flop like let's say the kim jones nike thing that he did the twp shoe that he did back in the day a few months a few months ago i think or maybe a couple of years ago let me see do you remember that one that nike let's see nike kim jones shoe that's a lwp this didn't really work out for them in this way right and this was the same sort of idea where you take this model that was probably in the works anyway or maybe it was in the archive and kim jones picked it out you get him to design a pair which is, I think, is these ones, right? Got them here. So you get this pair that he designs. Kim Jones put them out. This Kim Jones um, Nike Air Zoom LWP. Got them in three colorways. And then the hope is once that comes out and it does well, you can then iterate with general GR models and people maybe could uh, take them on board from there. So this is a, what well, you've got a rubberized dunk upper with bits of, suede it looks like i'm assuming we'll see a probably a video drop of these two they'll probably be a nike skate team will probably be able to probably put a film out based on it we'll probably might see other stores other more core skate stores doing a collab with them too especially with the resurgence of dc shoes with the, some of the collaborations that they've done over the last few months so we definitely can see these um popping out uh sooner rather than later but let's take a look at some of the images below of what the shoe actually looks like so got the conventional dog so there in lime green you've got the nike sb or nike air written at the back here with a bubble that's another addition to i then i've got to mention there's actually an air bubble too so nike dunks usually don't usually have an air bubble but they've got the air bubble he's got his kind of signature little orange pull tab on the on the side of the swoosh there the swoosh has been kind of gutted out to expose so you can see the, up, the absolute upper which looks pretty cool you've got the quintessential helvetica text on the laces with the uh, quotation marks there so again a shoot that i'm sure will look really good once skated into you know once beaten up a little bit um in different colorways too will look pretty cool and if anything it's probably a far more interesting take on the dunk than maybe some of the other grs that have come out i've i've been on record on here and saying that i'm not really a big fan of it i think it's too artificially done it's a little bit too uh contrived but i think stuff like this works really well it lands well with the brand with what virgil's trying to do in terms of connecting with the kids connecting back to these you know skating influences and back in that respect and again it's just a more of an interesting way to reintroduce a shoe that we all kind of know and love especially to a newer demographic maybe to the kids that want to wear skate lifestyle pieces and not actually skate and for the kids that actually do skate who actually want to wear a pair of nikes instead of wearing dcs or yes could have in connection with it um but yeah i like the silhouette it doesn't look as bananary that as i thought it would look some of the other pictures make it look a bit more pointed up it's got a great shape um i love the idea that it is definitely a, something that harkens back to a uh, an era where a lot of the shoes had different bits of paneling on the appa loads of really distracting little pieces the piping is really reminiscent of some old school shoes and maybe a dc with i forgot what it was it had like a frame pipe and it went around the, the right around the outside um so yeah definitely a shoe that i can see being you, you know you could visualize them doing like a vintage 90s inspired um advert for it or a little video edit um, you can envision them maybe pulling from the archive and maybe digging out some past athletes or some past, sorry, Nike sponsored um, skateboarders from back in the day and getting them to kind of rock a pair and do them justice. There's a lot of scope for these shoes. So I'm, I'm for one, quite excited to see what they look like once they get out. I'm not sure if this is going to be the final release, if they're going to have some tweaks on it by the end, but it should be really good. Again, I'd happy to skate them. Probably wouldn't necessarily wear them day to day. I think they'll probably be a lot, work, look a lot better once being up and stuff, but again we're not sure if, if it's a final model this is a feature by some chinese it looks like hanzu ying uh, profile on instagram i'm pretty sure they might get a hold of all the newer releases of shoes maybe through their chinese 
manufacturing sources and stuff let's see the instagram page yeah they've got images of some new release shoes so they look a bit whack here on the on the foot but the kid wearing them probably isn't really doing them justice but yeah i can't just see what's what they look like in action on the top of a board somewhere doing some heel flips some big spin so yeah they should look really cool so definitely keep an eye out for those no idea when they're going to come out or oh, they say release date spring 2020 so i'm assuming they'll be delayed too though a lot of the stuff is getting pushed back because of the whole coronavirus lockdown stuff so that might make sense which is interesting they're doing that right everyone's indoors everyone has disposable income because they've not been going out but they're deciding to push back releases of shoes they can, they, can, they can still sell them so that goes to show that most of the stuff that they're releasing they just want to release it so they can have a queue and have online have like kind of real life shop frenzy isn't it you don't really need to kind of push back a release of the release date of an exclusive shoe you just still put them out people are still going to buy them but you know what do I know so spring 2020 due to come out probably going to pass about 180 it says here judging by the Instagram caption but we never know so definitely keep an eye on that one that was a quick little bit of news there and they're talking about stuff getting pushed back. Unfortunately, it has come to my attention that the Casablancas, the New Balance 327s that I've spoken about a few times on here, are pushed back as well until, I think, next week maybe, right? This is from High Sobai. It says the release of the Casablanca New Balance's Ultimate Summer Shoe has been pushed back. Everyone keeps calling it the Ultimate Summer Shoe, so you know these are going to be hype.com once they do drop and i'm assuming they're going to be hard to get hold of because you know the dude that owns casablanca is very popular in the scene again i mentioned it before he's part of a le bon bon that really influential f club in paris that was um famous for having the logo drew up drawn up by um andre so i'm assuming he's gonna have loads of people on his line hitting him up for a pair so these are probably not going to be that widely available um, to the general public, I would assume. Uh, but it says the following here. Editors no first spotted uh, Casablanca's for the 2020 uh, Paris Fashion Week fashion show in January. The collaborated 3 to 7 has now been officially unveiled by the, 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 the sneakers are a clever model. Okay, cool. So April 18th is a new date. Due to the current global climate, it says here on the Instagram page, we postponed our Casablanca New Balance 327 launch to a new online only date of April 18th to ensure that the safest, most responsible delivery. Please subscribe to our members' club uh, newsletter for more details. So they were meant to come out, I think, this weekend, right? So now they're going to come out next weekend. So definitely keep an eye on those because they're not going to hang around. Um, and judging by all the other ones that are going to come out later down the line in terms of GRs and size exclusives, this is probably the better color you're going to get. I think there's meant to be two others, right? I think I saw five when I was looking at some showroom images. I saw one with white and black on it as well. So definitely keep an eye on those if you feel like you like them. But I mentioned a lot of people mentioned they did like them. $150 as well, which is a fairly um, fair price considering the fact that, you know, it's a newer model. It's uh, probably not going to be a GR, I'd assume. Maybe not. I'm not too sure. Because um, they do look like a summer shoe. Whether or not they're going to be able to... I'd imagine they're probably going to do a winterized version. Leather, maybe a bit of padding on the inside. I don't know. Maybe a different tread on the outside. I'm not too sure. But I'd imagine with the pushback in terms of dates, it might push back a few of the other releases for next year. So these might be the only time you'll be able to get a pair plus the size exclusives this year this calendar year i'd say and then the rest will come later on maybe during the middle of next year 2021 who knows but yeah that's some update on that one but let's get going to some other topics that i thought of interest here da, 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 what do i have to talk about here okay cool so talking about um live dj streams online which i'm still a bit finicky about i'm not too sure if i'm actually a big fan of them i should have mentioned before dax j one the other day was pretty cool kind of music did a really cool one on the united we stream platform that was really amazing they were able to debut some new merch on there too tie that in with their e-commerce you know release some uh, debuted some new unreleased tracks and all that good stuff and it was in the swimming pool though i think let me actually show you it it was actually not too bad um Maybe they didn't really utilize the swimming pool space as best as they could, right? If you're going to, I'd imagine if you're going to do that sort of thing, you'd want to maybe use the setting that you're using to its full capacity in somewhat. But let me see if I can get it up for you guys to see here. Kind of music, United Stream. 
Okay, right do we stream? So this is it here, the full set from the label. So it looks like they kitted out this amazing uh, swimming pool area thing. It had everyone from the label playing. Judging here from the description, who they had Ed, Adam Port opening, right? Yeah, Adam Port opening, Anime Rampa, and then Resnick to close. I would have maybe preferred to have seen a bit more use of the swimming pool. If you're looking at this really, uh, if you're listening via the podcast, I'm sorry, it's just a swimming pool that they're sort of in with this, this amazing sort of cathedral style of maybe Greek bathhouse style swimming pool. The water, obviously, the swimming pool water has been filled up as well. They've got the decks right at the top with some mesh across the table. And it's just to kind of face on. I would have thought they might have maybe tried to get the decks inside the pool. Uh, that would have been pretty cool and if they had the vr or, or augmented reality source i think someone using they could have easily had like the water gushing all around them as they're playing but i'm sure they probably didn't have the budget for it or they didn't want to do it in general but that would have been probably cooler to have them actually down at the bottom of their swimming pool that might have affected the acoustics but i thought this was a pretty cool set yeah all things considered so um, with that in mind, RA decided to put together a platform that you could then go and check all the live streams that are happening. Judging by what some some of the memes I've been seeing on the uh, the worst techno memes ever, I think some people are already reaching the point of fatigue when it comes to the DJ live streams. People are just probably popping in, checking it, and just popping back out again. So I wouldn't recommend. Um, pushing your thing too hard I'm assuming on social but if you're eager to find out who's playing what events are going to be on Resident Advisor this have launched here I'm um, reading it via their site announced the Streamland a new listing hub for virtual events says this will make submitting online only listings easier and connecting listeners and streamers around the world so obviously it's probably more so beneficial to um, people putting on the event I'm assuming so they have a way of kind of populating their events pages on their profiles and RA and for people who do use RA events I'm not sure how many actually do I know I do often when you know when we're able to go outside you're able to then connect and see what's actually going on because I'm sure a lot of people have been missing <laughs> missing a lot of the streams and I guess I'm not a fan of watching live streams live personally because i think you know if we live in a digital age we live in the internet age the whole reason why you have online streaming is so you can watch it after the fact and re-watch it and clip it whatever it may be but sometimes i do understand that some people wouldn't watch something after the fact because they just too can't be bothered to spend an hour sitting down watching something all the way through again they would rather just watch it in the moment pop out walk around the house have a smoke have it playing in the background and when it finishes it finishes and then you're done with it as opposed to having this thing linger in the back of your head that you have a four hour set from a media lens to play do you know what I mean I understand that kind of rationale but this article says the following it says um, our resident advisor is rolling out a new geotag for virtual events um, as the electronic music scene adapts to safety risk large gatherings and current pose uh, currently posed during the COVID-19 pandemic RA um, has created Streamland. Head to the listings and filter Streamland location in your country menu. This page is dedicated to virtual only events, offering self isolating rave as a helpful index for finding the best digital parties broadcast from across the globe. I wonder if they're going to keep doing this once or they're going to keep this option open, feature available once everything settles back down again. I think that would be pretty cool because I'm sure there's a lot of people that do these virtual streaming events, especially online radio shows like NTS or. Um, that new place on in the new place in Berlin is it Hoa H O H O E R H O R in Berlin, and if you have a place that do online streaming, they'll probably be welcome. They'll probably welcome something like this, right? So they can obviously put have their own timetable on their website, but you also got a place to kind of populate and advertise stuff via the RA platform. A lot of people already use, so that'd be pretty cool. And again, if you've got the, if you want to charge for it, you know which is probably not the best idea but if you do want to do that i think um crossbreeds actually did that the other day um you could potentially do that through there too it says yeah i'm sure you know, I'm offering promoters artists and collectives an option uh, for reaching fans interested in having a dance through the world wide web listing events here is the same as submitting regular events on ra be sure to tag all your artists on the lineup include a high resolution image and write a summary of your party description all events on streamlab will be in coordinated universal time 
it's UTC for extra clarity we recommend also listing the exact time in major cities like London, Berlin, New York and uh, uh, yes what's a good idea if you have a link to a system already include it in the event description for easy access easy every week we'll highlight up and broadcasters RA picks that's great for those with streaming ambitions who are struggling to the technical side we've created a step-by-step -step guide so definitely RA have done a lot of good work man they've stepped up and provided that ongoing news thing feed that they do where they kind of populate all the stuff happening in dance music regarding corona and they've also set up this platform um they've given you tips on how to get your streaming platform uh sorted out and get going so they're doing a lot of a lot of work to make sure the scene is informed and up to date as to what's occurring so i definitely recommend you check that out um streamland available now on the ra site let's see if they have anything uh available here that's a form to fill it out let me see where is it the listing events here so yeah if you go on the events page of your streamland site a tab is correct here it's basically in terms of location you can change it but you got streamland down there and then when you scroll down you got all the events happening during the week so you've got diggers all the live events that you can check out for your heart's desire most of them pop off usually on the weekends it seems like because you know that's probably especially if people are working from home they're probably the only time they're going to be able to party and get on it properly so that makes a lot of sense but yeah definitely recommend you check that out i think it's a really good initiative and a really good way to connect people especially if you're interested most people aren't it seems like most people don't really give a shit about watching live streams i know i don't i'm a bit fatigued by it all and it really just bums me out really you know the idea that you can just watch these things and not be able to go out is not really the best thing but if, you, if you're interested definitely check that out what else is on the list here to talk about oh talking about ra this really cool article they published actually the other day was really gave me the feels and maybe miss clubbing it's the called the last cocktail there more at grease muller it's a feature piece um that they put together with one of their best writers on there will leach or was it will lynch will leach how you pronounce his name let me see at the bottom here uh will lynch from ra uh, put together this really cool ode to uh cocktail de more one of the premier parties i was saying berlin for the most part for the last five years or so really cool amazing gay night um i think i stumbled across it via maybe an essay daniel wang wrote uh back in the day maybe four or five years ago that was featured on electronic beats and he kind of wrote this amazing essay on the experience that he had around the party the people that he met the sets that he played um just in as a real good way to capture the hedonistic you know values or feelings that were associated with that place and you know being that I went to Grace Miller prior to going to Cocteau de Amour, I connected with it a lot more. And then once you go to Cocteau de Amour, the first time you start to realize, okay, cool, these guys are doing a whole different thing. They did do it for a short time. They did really, they did um, do a few Cocteau de Amour parties in different locations. I remember they were in Sao Paulo. They did one in London, I'm pretty sure. Is it London? What do they do? Not in London. Where do they do it? Somewhere else. Anyway, they did usually sometimes try to have their main people who I think are called Disco de Mora, I think it's called. The duo they were they kind of did a few pop-up events here and there or were playing on lineups or whatever it may be but if you really wanted to experience the magic of hotel there more you had to go to Greece Mirror to experience it and um, be around the locals but I thought this article was really cool and did a good way of kind of conceptualize or kind of uh, putting it into a bit of a time capsule because unfortunately Greece Mirror closed its doors due to some uh, some um, conflict with the local council but let's read a little bit of it here so this is the last dance cut to do more at Grace Mueller on R8. It says the following. Uh, a few weeks before clubs close across the world, a beloved Berlin party bid farewell to its spiritual home. Here are some moments and memories from the final cocktail de Amour at Grace Mueller. And it continues. It says here, um, a, few afters, a few hours after her set at last cocktail de Amour at Grace Mueller, Jackie House, the honey sound system DJ, stood in the back of the room known as Winter Garden, dressed in black and white, stripped, uh, train conductor's uniform outside rain fell on the shacks and silos and grease miller's muddy backyard in here the air was thick and wet and mostly shirtless crowd forming a people soup to quote one onlooker that poured into every corner the dance floor a lumpy stretch of dirt was packed shoulder to shoulder people climbed onto whatever race services they could find some vogued others played it cool chatting or rolling splits as they danced jacob meanhan from the berlin party buttons was playing back to back with jeffrey sifri a detroit-based dj a friend of cocktail family he released one of their label's best records a synth pop ep produced by uh, sophie 
Jackie gazed at the scene and quipped, I've never missed this. I've never missed a good funeral party, which is awesome. Line there. Um, they put together a really cool playlist too on uh, Spotify called The Last Cocktail Day and More and Grace Miller with some of the tracks that were played uh, during a hedonistic moment. This is here, it continues. This is the final party of a Grace Miller at Berlin Club with a former Patty Pasta Factory, sorry, that closed at the beginning of February. It was not the final cocktail day or more, a beloved gay party that was good around before Grace Miller and will carry on somewhere else. But it was undoubtedly the end of something special. And that's usually the thing about it. I think I remember when I was putting on club nights, especially the most popular of the ones I put on, so special alibi. Most of the reason why that thing was special or that thing worked at that time was the time and place it happened the fact that we were all sort of like coming of age at the same sort of time people are figuring out what they wanted to do in their lives people naturally had this you know for the most part most people figured out what they wanted to do and not wanting to do through um through nightlife and through everything else happening on that platform so all those things sort of helped um to usher in a new generation of creatives and all that sort of good stuff right and then once that place I've noticed, especially with the alibi during the kind of the last few years, once that, once it started to, once the council started to kind of put the squeeze in the place, started to limit the hours it was open, started to take away some of the late licenses and maybe, you know, some of the owners fell out with some of the past promoters and people moved on and people went to other places and, you know, life just happened. The vibe already started to die. And then as soon as the caboose was put on it, it was essentially the death of most of the club nights are on there. I'm not sure if there's a lot of them that still survive in other locations because <coughs> especially if you had a good spot, they were able to give you a, a promotion run, you know, every month that was, you know, that you were more than happy to kind of uh, take them up on, um, which isn't necessarily the usual thing I've heard from lots of club nights. People or people that put on nights still, usually it's more common that you'll get a, a time to put on a party maybe every other month, every other couple of months. So the fact that we were able to have something consistently for the best part of a year booked six months ahead of time was a real blessing at the time and something that you only kind of really uh, appreciate later on down the line especially when you go to other places and you hear that you know when the club night ends the club ends as well it's sort of like a double whammy so if you're a fan of Grease Muda or even if you're not that big of a fan of Costa de Amor to find out that not only is that the last party is going to be there if you're not a fan of it it's also going to be the end of that party and the end of that club in the first place which is you know apart from maybe Cata Blue or maybe a few other places, I'm not too sure if I can get them from the top of my head. There's not a lot of places like Grease Mule still around in Berlin, you know, the, the really antithesis of like that um, post Berlin Wall falling sort of like run down derelict spaces. They don't really exist anymore in that way. They use, they're mostly polished, not polished, but they're mostly established bars that have been turned into late night after hour places, which is the best part about it. That's I think that's what saves that place generally, even though the gentrification looks like it's been affecting everyone little by little. But I think the fact that bars in general can stay open later, they're able to turn like, imagine like a Rose's bar, right? Um, in, in, in Cop Basso Tour, they're able to turn that into like a late night hangout spot because you can still have a dance in there and sit down and you know you get freaky with your date that you met on tinder just the other day so that still works out but what can you do um the article continues it says here in the three year in their five year run at greece for me the cotton gym more built something that earned them a cult following and a chapter in the history of berlin club culture which is all you want really you know when you put on a night i guess you can never think i think um i heard um because i've just finished watching this really cool documentary that I uploaded on my channel I'll definitely check it out it's called uh, berlin bouncers it came out last year and it features three prominent bouncers in Berlin. Um, one guy that used to do the dancing at Kingside, I forgot his name, Sven obviously from Berghain, and this guy called Smiley, who has his own little um, company uh, that he runs, or kind of, you know, a security firm that he runs in Berlin, where he sort of offers up a different idea on, on door pickers, all that sort of good stuff. But that aside, I remember Sven mentioning that documentary, that part of, the, part of what makes Berlin, Berlin special is that no one ever thought it was going to stay around this long right they're all i think they all kind of feel as if like every year is a blessing every year is a sort of like oh my god i can't believe we've still managed to blag this right so when you put it on a club night there is a thing in the back of your head where you know it's not gonna last forever i remember this reading a really cool interview i forgot who it was with it might have been something to do with maybe the downtown new york scene back in the day but i remember someone mentioning something that really stuck with me it might have been maybe an andy warhol thing that most scenes or most little most club culture things or most scenes only last for four years it might have been even a michelle lammy article based on her 
old cafe restaurant thing that she used to have prior to meeting Rick Owens. But I remember something along those lines where they said the subcultures only last for there's a four year cycle. So every four years, a whole ba- new batch of people come in and then they start their own thing and they essentially phase out the oldies and maybe some, you know, some staunch believers hang on. But it sort of has a way of uh, replenishing or, you know, um, starting anew itself. It's a sort of self correcting system in that sort of way. You know, some people probably go on to do other things. Um, I know a lot of people that I started doing club nights with have kind of gone on to do festivals, they've kind of gone on to do bigger events, they've kind of gone on to start record labels. So people kind of evolve and then the space is left for the other people, more scrappy kids to come in and sort of fill the void. So I guess when you put on these events, part of you knows that it's not going to last forever, but you just want to be a, a part of like the cultural uh, entertainment sort of timeline. You want people to kind of look back and when they kind of, you know, reminisce about days gone by they can include you in their memory like oh yeah i remember you remember that crazy dude that put on that party in that place and that is basically what you do it for you do it for that kind of glory i'm assuming it's similar to rich dudes that want to build skyscrapers right you want to be you want it to be part of your legacy so that when you're long and gone people can kind of look at the little plaque on the outside of the wall and say oh cool that's that guy that did this you know what i mean um so at least if you're not remembered by your deeds you're at least remembered by the things that you're able to produce i don't know but in its continuity, it says uh, the music policy was guided by the founders Giacomo uh, Garavelleno and Giovanni Torco, aka Disco Disco Drama, the booker Juan Ramos, and the party's twenty-some odd residents, which is fucking cool. And again, that's what I, I mentioned about other places that get wrong. This is a club night that runs on a Grace Mule, which I'm sure they were able to probably get those guys gigs in the actual club themselves. But they've got twenty rotating residents that always play. So what ends up happening is that. For the most of the time that I used to go, I never used to care about the lineup. You just go, I think it's the first Friday of the month, or I forgot, first, whatever it was, and whatever time that is, is on, you just go. You don't care who's playing because you trust and believe that the programming, the talent book, or the bookers, or whatever it may be, is going to get it right. Um, and of course, as a club like themselves, they're given licenses, they're given a license by the club, maybe again, it's partly too because it's a success, but they're given the opportunity to book people who can actually get a party started as opposed to just booking the bait people that are going to sell tickets they kind of be given a bit of a platform to do that too which doesn't happen often either right you, there is a lot of pressure from club managers and stuff to always kind of make sure you're making enough money in the tail which essentially means you have to get bigger people to come in to try partners to come and drink but then if you had any experience with nights you would know that when you get a bigger person to come play they might guarantee um, a lot of people coming into the club but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to get high drink sales because they, people that are aware of clubbing culture will know that your headline act will probably play at the end right so they'll probably come later on so they won't drink as much and that will affect your take it's a whole really fucked up situation but the way to rectify it is to kind of be as a bar manager or so if you're an event or if you're the person that owns a place is to sort of give the people that are putting on the nights uh, you know a uh, basically a remit that they just put on something fun that they enjoy obviously they have to reach a certain threshold in order to kind of make it sustainable or worthwhile but not really push them too much in order to kind of make a lot of money at the till because especially in the formative years of a club night once you're trying to find your legs and trying to find your sound and your tribe it's never going to be that successful anyway you want people to kind of trust and believe in your vision and over time as you build a relationship with the djs and the agents and the bookers you can then grow it from there it says the following year, the da, 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 20 years residence was bold and refined, covering disco house, rave and chill out. The club's strange architecture with its free rooms and countless hiding places and sprawling garden along a dirty canal created a surreal sense of alternate reality. I don't really agree with that. There's the times I spent chatting aimlessly about, you know, world domination with an absolute stranger I just met two minutes ago was one of the best moments I've had, you know, tram- tramping up onto the whole uh, platform, the, the winter garden thing where you sit on the top and you sort of act like a big kid and look over the sunset is incredible. It says, um, the, 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 the regulars together with Gishmir's staff and former and cold cocktail crew formed a massive cheeky family. It's a quote, it says, uh, that's what made it so special, said Trent, one of the resident DJs along with side, his friend Dra- uh, Dama. You were sure to find everybody on the first Saturday of the month here. Uh, we went to basically every cocktail sometimes we were not supposed to play and then the club was too packed to close so we go home pick our records and dj till monday morning that's the dream really in it imagine that rocking up to fold one day and then they say oh look the guys didn't turn up or you know he fell asleep can someone play that'll be the dream 
it continues here. So if you ever look at the Cocktail Facebook group, it's like thousands of people. Said one ram was the party's booker and one of the resident DJs. If you go to any uh, metropolitan city, London, New York, Paris, everyone probably has a gay friend who can say, oh yeah, I've been to Cocktail, which is one of the things that you want in it. You want that. And again, you know, it reminds me of a little bit. Um, Love Fever. That was a really seminal sort of night in London too. That was, that kind of had this a law to it that um it's still there now i think if they were able to put on the night but it was a very special moment but this is you know some of the pictures on here are flipping the fantastic really recommend check i'm not gonna read the entire thing because it's quite long but it's a really cool essay you've got some some cool little flyers as well from the event jesus knows you're masturbating you got riding on the cock of the world some really cheeky kind of post-its here you've got this which says life is short and there's always uh, and there will always be dirty dishes so let's dance i definitely agree with that one you've got this amazing image of a guy kissing someone's feet on his knees with knee pads just some great stuff you've got this very great neon light at the background here that sort of looks like a cross that people are sort of dancing in front of which is really ominous but we recommend you check it out a super cool um essay written by Will Leach published the other day um, again a really cool ode to it hopefully they're able to find a new home for the place because I would love to visit once everything settles down but for those of you that have been to Bruce Miller RIP and let the memories live on let the memories live on let's move on there as well what else we talk about here what's the last let's talk about something here <laughs> What else we want to talk about? Oh, just be this opens up. Let's see what this is about here. Talk to this one. This is an interesting news actually here from Hypebeast. Um, Joshua Vides, somebody who I know uh, pretty well, I'd say, based on the, some of the stuff that we did previously at my previous place of occupation, Master B. Had or I had the opportunity to kind of get him involved in the streetwear program that I was. Uh, uh, part of co-producing and now he's gone on to do bigger and better thing which is kind of cool to see to got a collaboration here uh, a joint capsule collection with Fendi that he's going to debut in very very soon this headline here from Joshua Vidas joins Fendi for both black and white California sky collection um, features here from Hypebeast says with collaborations ranging from Nike to Woolridge LA based uh, artist Joshua Vidas has added another partnership to his list which is cool and I think he's pivoting away from being a brand owner more from being an artist which allows him to sort of plug in his expertise his knowledge into different brands that's sort of like the Hiroshi Fujiwara model that I think most people should aspire to be like instead of you know standing side to side with a brand and being kind of shackled to them the idea that you can be creative and sort of do loads of different projects with different people definitely where to go and kind of definitely um, increases your brand value or your kind of clout level for that respect for that um, for that aspect so it continues here with collaborations ranging from Nike to Woolridge, a based artist Joshua Vides has added another partnership to a list of to a list uh, with his California Sky Collection with Fendi. After designing the Italian house customization bar, the temporary Fendi Cafe at Harris last summer, Vides has started a first look at the collaborative range of apparel and accessories, which must be a dream come true for him. And working with a, an actual lecture company like Fendi on clothes must be really cool. He says here, um, known for his recognizable black and white marker style, Vides has created a, an assortment of jackets, matching sets, bucket hats and more in his monochromic uh, color scheme designed range from flower printed trousers shirts to striped blazers with matching wide leg pants Vidas outlines um, fitted jackets jeans and skirts with bold black and white outlines and shaded detailing that assembles it resembles sorry his attentive artistic style this is repeating itself seven times on hypebeast but yeah let's go through some of the images look here see what he's got he's got featured you've got a cool little denim uh, jacket sort of vibe or maybe it's like a coach jacket sort of vibe outfit here and the lady at the back's got the same sort of thing too i love the fact that it's sort of shaded the underarms of it which looks really interesting that's super interesting um let's go open that image again you've got the trainers fendi trainers done with the outline as well a nice t-shirt with ribbing and the socks too and the hat it kind of reminds me who is it reminds me of is it jack not jack who's what's his name that New York based artist that died in the 80s from AIDS with glasses. It sort of reminds me a little bit of that, but it's a really cool way of doing it. He's got this amazing pajama double breasted suit edition here on the right hand side. This lady's wearing looks really cool. Great bucket hat. Nice uh, take on a bomber jacket that he's also done. 
again really really well designed stuff i'm sure would we'll, we'll do really well and unfortunately it would have been great to see this stuff out now i'm sure a lot of the kind of street style influencer type people would have been all over this if it would have been available but um alas that is not the case but yeah definitely cool collaboration from him i'm glad to see him doing bigger and better things since the time that i've met him when i was at mastered but yeah definitely give that a look see when that's available no actual date on here saying when it's available but definitely check it out i'm assuming sometime yeah sometime in the summer is going to drop here on the website but definitely keep an eye out for that one and congratulations to him on that and i think that might be it we're going to end it there actually pause it there as per usual thanks so much for tuning in to exodus english episode number 301 if it's your first time listening of course smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment below let me know what you think of the show if you watch listening via the podcast app of course please give it a five star review and share with your friends you can follow me on the socials i'm at Axel Zinger, all one word on Twitter, and I'm also Axel Zinger, all one word on Instagram. Be able to find links to that down below in the description. Um, and until then, I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care, be safe.